Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into God's word. Lord, as we come to the last three weeks of our epic series, I thank you for meeting us along the way. We've shared this one great story of your love throughout the ages from Genesis to Revelation. And Lord, we find ourselves almost at the end. Yet there are many even in this room who still find themselves at a place of challenge, at a place of despair. We pray that you show up and bring them joy and peace and freedom this day. That they leave here very differently than they walked in, Lord God. That they will have encountered you in this place. That they would fall deeply in love with you and that they would live for you all the days of their life. So, Lord, speak to us through your word today. Touch us, change us, guide us, direct us in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And everybody says, amen. Amen. So we are rounding out this series called Epic. We've been doing it all year. It's been a wonderful one-year Bible journey. We've really gotten a big overview of it. So if you haven't been here and would like to catch some of those messages, just download our app or go to our website. You can check some of those out online. Today, we find ourselves in a book that we don't read all that often. It's called the book of First John. And if you have your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to turn there. If you don't, you could do so on our app or you could look on the screens for the uh, verses that we'll be projecting. So this is written by John, and John is really known as the guy who talks a lot about love. Man, how many of you just need a little more love in your life, right? The peace and joy that comes from a love and relationship with Jesus Christ. And he knew what it was like to see Jesus face to face. And I'm praying that some of you encounter him in that very same way this morning. He opens up with the following words in 1 John 1, 4. He gives us the purpose and reason behind this writing. It says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, maybe you have a joyful spirit when you walked in here today. Maybe you didn't. Hopefully before you leave, you'll have just a little bit more joy, 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 joy down in my heart. I'm not going to sing that. That would be really, really bad. But somehow it just came to my mind. In fact, when we opened up the service today, we sang a a song that's been a chart topper during the month of December for the past 300 years. It was written by Isaac Watts in 1719. It says, joy to the world, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing. Let earth receive her king. And part of that that I see as a real key to finding joy is that verse that was kind of right there in the middle that says, let every heart prepare him room. Because I think what we're going to witness in the book of John today is that sometimes we got a whole lot of junk that's gumming us up and filling us up that's very far from Christ. And it's hard for Christ to fill us with this joy when you got a whole bunch of junk going on in your life. Can I get an amen? amen? So maybe today we could lay a few of those things by the wayside and lay some of our garbage at the feet of Jesus and let him take it because he says in his word that his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and some of you need to lighten up just a little bit here. Come on, I need to see some smiles. Smile, I don't see much joy on your faces. Some people can clap. The rest of you are just boring. What's wrong with you Christians? I mean, like... Come on, you can do a little bit better than that. Give God a little bit of joy. Get some joy going. Get some excitement going. Or has the world got you down right now in the midst of all this busyness? I mean, driving down Blanding Boulevard right now could get you down just a little bit this time of the year, right? I mean, that guy who wrecked on the the highway this past week and gummed up all of Jacksonville, right? We get upset with these people and maybe we shouldn't. You've probably been to 52 different parties just during the month of December. In fact, I was so busy this month that I didn't even have time to shave till this morning. You want to see what I looked like last night? Let's see if they got a picture. See that right there? I mean, that's what I looked like. It gave me gray hair. I mean, it was just, oh, I can't believe Mary Jo puts up with me. What is she doing? Putting up with me. In fact, we were at 
Smiley's last night with our Jiu-Jitsu Claws family. We had a great time hanging out and had a big party there last night. And you could take that down now, please. You don't need to leave that up there. That was kind of embarrassing, but uh, we had a great time. And maybe you have too. You've been to all those parties and you're busy, uh, but that's not what the season's really about. The season is about Jesus. It's about this newborn king, the one who came to save the world. This silent night that changed the world for everybody. This star that illuminated the skies that caused the wise men to seek after him. And man, would we do that today? Would we recapture a little bit of the reason for the season? So John gives us some more beautiful and glorious words in 1 John 1, 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not within us. So Jesus comes to illuminate the darkness. And I think that's a big reason that during this time of the year and even during our own birthday celebrations, we always illuminate them with light, right? And whenever I see them, no matter how down I am, I'm telling you, it does something in my spirit where seeing Christmas lights just cheers me up. Because when I look at it, it reminds me of baby Jesus who came to save me, that God loved me enough that he would send his one and only begotten son to die in my place for my sins that I might have life. So I get great joy every single Christmas season, yet even in the midst of that joy, I know not every one of those Christmases has been good for me. And I know that in my life, like they talked about here in scripture, um, there's a lot of sin that still lurks around in these dark places that needs to come out so that I could be filled with the light and life of Jesus. There's things that I still struggle with on a daily basis. And to say that we do not struggle, this scripture says, then guess what? Then we're calling ourselves a liar, right? Or we're calling him a liar if we say that we do not struggle. Does anybody ever struggle in here? Or is it just me? Am I in the right place today? Amen, right? So we have these struggles, we have these challenges, this sin that lives within us that we still battle with from time to time. It does not represent who we are, yet we still struggle in so many areas of our life. And this word is going to bring us great hope because Jesus died for a reason. He died that we might have life. He died that we might be part of his family. And then when we start to get this, it impacts not only us, but as he was intimating and we'll build upon here a little bit later, it also can influence those around us. It could start to bring joy to them. It could start to bring them into the saving grace and knowledge of who Jesus really is. See, I have lived some very sick times in my life where I was totally in despair, and some of you might be in that very place today. We've had some wonderful Christmas seasons in our life, and there's been other ones that were absolutely horrific and completely embarrassing, well beyond any costume that I might have wore last night, right? I can think back to some of those Christmases where I was still in the midst of my addiction, and I can't even imagine what it had been for Mary Jo to accompany me to the family party because she didn't know what Eric was going to come out. Was Eric going to behave himself or was going to Eric have so much to drink that he would embarrass himself, embarrass her, and embarrass us in front of the entire family? Yet she loved me enough to still be with there with me, and there was a few of those that were off the charts embarrassing, right? There was one Christmas where, in retrospect, I felt terrible. I mean, even the next day, I was so addicted that I had to call the drug dealer while we're in the midst of our Christmas party and have him meet me outside of my parents' house so that I could go sneak outside to meet him to get drugs for a moment. And everybody knew what the heck I was doing. It wasn't no joke to them. They were all mad. My mom was mad. My dad was mad. My wife was mad. Thank God the kids were so little that they didn't even know any difference to it. But that's how bad it had become. 
There was this sin that lived within me, even as a believer, that I couldn't overcome. And scripture calls these things a strong hold. They have a strong hold on us. They need something more powerful to topple them, to take them out so that we can have freedom in our lives. So I would cry out, Lord, help me. Don't let me do this again tomorrow. Some of you have heard that part of my story. For whatever reason, even in the midst of my sin, and this is no justification, this is no nothing, but somehow deep down there was enough of the love of Christ inside of me where I would say on Christmas Day, like, I'm not getting high, I'm not getting drunk, and somehow I abided by that on Christmas Day out of some form of distorted reverence, right? But it was jacked up, and some of you have been there. Others of you have had different struggles. Maybe yours wasn't the same as mine, but right now you're dealing with some stuff that you can't get over. You came to the right place this morning. We're not here to judge you. We're here to bring you freedom. We're here to speak hope into your life. We're here to tell you that you can live differently, that your Christmases in the future can be different than the Christmases that you've had in the past. It doesn't mean that they won't be without some struggle from time to time for different reasons, but maybe you won't be the cause for that embarrassment, right? Thank you, Lord. He can help us. He can change us. He can make us new. And we're going to witness that here in Scripture in just a moment. I was sick and darkness had overtaken me, but Christ came in with great love. He is the light of life. And if you're here today and you're struggling, there is hope. John tells us about it in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I love how he addresses this and he builds upon these words as we go through scripture today. He starts with, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate in the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly does the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You might say, yeah, Eric, yeah, right, but I still struggle every day. This verse should bring you great hope because it says you have an advocate in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a second. Even when you or your loved ones are in the midst of the greatest despair, we know from other scriptures combined with this one that Jesus is actually praying for you in heaven. How crazy is that to think about? Jesus, the son of the living God, is advocating to God the Father on your behalf. That's my son, that's my daughter, that's my brother, that's my sister. I died so that they might have life. How many of your friends have done that for you, right? There's a big religious word that was there in the midst of it. It's called propitiation. It means to die in your place for your sins, to take your debt that you are owed and pay it on your behalf. How cool is that? Man, to have someone else pay it for you. Jesus, our lawyer, our advocate, right? He pays the penalty for us. I've had a few encounters with lawyers and all they ever wanted was my money. They didn't want me to like pay. Hey, I'll go serve your sentence for you. No offense to any lawyers in the room. I know there's a few. We love you guys. But, the, <laughs> the, you know, to have them stand up and not just advocate on your behalf, but to say, I'll pay the penalty for their sin. That's what this verse is saying, that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. And guess what? It said, if you will sin, God knows we're going to sin. Guess what? You're probably going to sin today. And guess what? You're probably going to sin tomorrow. But you know, the beauty of scripture and the beauty of what Jesus did, it says that your sins past, present, and future are forgiven. How amazing is that? Here's how I don't want you to read that, though, for just a second, because I know in my distorted mentality in the midst of my addiction, even as a believer, there was a day that a guy walked up to me and he said a scripture and he said, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I was like, good, I can go get high this afternoon. I ain't going to get in trouble. That's not what the scripture says, okay? <laughs> just get to getting that point right. See, the amazing grace of God 
does something beautiful in our lives that the law could never do. See, the law binds us. The law causes us to rebel. But when someone loves us enough to take the penalty for us, nine times out of 10, we're grateful for that. Oh my gosh, thank you for paying off my debt. Thank you for doing this on my behalf. So much so that when we know the penalty for our sin is death, that when Jesus comes and he brings us life by dying in our place for us, the natural reaction for most of us is to worship him. To say, thank you, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. See, it's the grace and love of God that overwhelms us. You're never going to be able to guilt anybody into not sinning. You know how many times Mary Jo and my family walked up to me and said, Eric, don't do drugs. Eric, don't drink. Eric, I didn't smoke, but don't smoke. Don't do this. Don't do whatever it is. You know what happened to me in my rebellious mind when they said that? I was going to go do more, <laughs> you know. But when the grace of the love of Jesus Christ began to overwhelm me, it was more like, God, I don't want to disappoint you. Lord, I don't want to do this again. Lord, your word says that I will be a new creation in you. Will you begin to make that manifest? Lord, there's these strongholds in my life that I can't get over by myself. Lord God, would you change me? Would you remove those things? Would you take that sin from me? Would you put me in a place where I could please you? It's the same thing like, I don't want to cheat on my wife. I don't want to do things to disappoint her. Why? Because I love her and she loves me. Even when I look jacked up like I did last night, I mean, like she loves me. She helps me. Why would I want to do anything that would disappoint her? She's had grace for me in the midst of all my sins. She's been there along my side for 30 years. Why would I want to disappoint her? It's the same thing. I think deep down, those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we don't want to disappoint Jesus, but we do fall into these things from time to time. So the reaction can't be turtling up and being like, no, I'm going to keep going on. I'm going to keep doing what I do. The reaction needs to become, Lord, help me. Lord, I love you. We're, we can't be embarrassed anymore. We can't um, go out there and just act like we've got it all together. Guys, we don't have it all together. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to come up here to the altar. Man, don't let the devil trick you into having pride and holding on to your sin when if you just come up here and leave it at the feet of Jesus, you could live a totally different life. Grace has a way of causing us to sin no more. Our old selfish desires begin to pass away and God will replace them with a desire to please him. Then as he hinted at earlier, somehow when this begins to happen, it causes us to want to love others as well, even those who are deemed unlovable. First John 2, 7. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness has passed away and the true light is already coming. Whoever says that he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother and abides in the light and him, there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If you want to experience true joy and you want to experience freedom, we need to forgive. We need to forgive. Some of you are saying, but that person did something to me. There's no way I could forgive them, right? I'm here to tell you that the longer you hold on to that unforgiveness, the less space there is because that unforgiveness is filling up everything inside of you. If you don't release that stuff, you're never going to have freedom. There's never going to be room for the Lord to flood in by the power of the Holy Spirit and fill you up so that you could have joy because you're holding on to all this garbage. You're holding on to all this sin. You're holding on to all this unforgiveness when oftentimes two simple words can begin to change everything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How many relationships could be restored? How different might life be? Maybe God's even putting somebody on your heart right now that you need to go say that to after this service, that you need to go and reach out to. 
Yesterday, we held the Freedom Conference here. It was a beautiful thing. See a lot of people in Freedom shirts. If you're, if you're at Freedom yesterday, would you stand up for a second? Give these folks a round of applause. If you're not in Freedom, I encourage you to go. God's doing some great things through it. Amen. Y'all look pretty, but you can sit back down. It's okay. One of the speakers boldly shared their testimony about living a life where they cheated on someone and were later cheated upon. Um, it was a very difficult thing that made significant ramifications into every area of their life and family, and rightly so. It's one of the biggest things that you could do to kind of hurt somebody else is when you do that, the level of betrayal, the level of distrust. Um, it affects not only the relationship at hand, but family members and everybody else. Everybody hated him for what he had done, you know, and, and it's difficult and it's challenging. But he explained how ultimately going through a process of restoration and a process where he had to ask for forgiveness and humility, that God ended up restoring relationships. Now, the person that he was with ended up getting married, and uh, he's in another relationship now a number of years later, and there was difficulties and bombs and everything that just blew up all around it. But he said, you know what? For the first time last year, both our families gathered together, and we actually celebrated Christmas together. How amazing is that? The forgiveness that comes from that. He says, this year, we're all having Christmas together at the same house. They wanted the families and the grandkids and everybody to be able to be together because reconciliation had happened to that degree. That's restoration. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I laughingly told it it would sound strange in most contexts, but you know, I had to go to um, a week or so ago, my dad had heart surgery, so I went down to South Florida and uh, he had to stay overnight. So my mom ended up staying at the house of my dad's ex-wife and spent the night with her. That sounds weird, right? <laughs> now, my mom and dad have been married for over 40 years, but uh, you know, it's been a long time since then. But I remember days like when my brother and sister were in high school and uh, the fighting that was there and the nastiness and the hatred that was going around. And then God so moved over the years where they actually restored those relationships to a place of peace where they actually got to a place where my mom was actually staying at her house. I was like, this is weird, but this is cool, you know? And uh, it was beautiful to see. They've actually vacationed together and only God can do those kinds of things where he can restore them. So. Some of you might be in the midst of that right now where there's relationships that you believe would be unredeemable and there's no way that they could come back around, that it seems like there's just no way. But what if you initiated? What if you were the one that said, forgive me, Lord, help me. Lord, it's not meant to be that way. And then when God moves in those situations, how beautiful it is to put another knock on the devil's head right? So that he doesn't get any advantage because he's always seeking to kill, steal, and destroy and mess up relationships and divide people. How beautiful it is when the Lord moves and touches and changes. And guess what? You're as jacked up as the other person. You need just as much help as they do, right? Man, maybe you're struggling, but I want to encourage you to begin to call these things into existence. Verses like 1 John 2.12 give me a lot of hope. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven in his namesake. That same speaker shared with me beforehand that every time that he wanted to get up and either, say, pray during our prayer meetings that we have or even in getting ready to go up there and speak yesterday, the devil would begin to talk to him. You're not worthy. You can't get up there and share your testimony. You can't talk with other people. You can't serve the Lord. There's no hope for you. There's no hope for you and your family. The devil's gonna do everything he can to keep you in despair. Those are the times where we need to remember these verses and be like, the Bible says I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. The Bible says the devil, you are a liar, so get thee behind me, Satan, because I'm gonna walk out what God has in store for me. You need to put the devil in his place. Then John, wisely so, begins to give some challenges out. 1 John 2.13. I am writing to you fathers. Remember, he started out with little children, right? I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who was, who is from the beginning. 
I am writing you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Men, we need to change. Men, we need to begin to lead. Men, we need to begin to take initiative. Men, we need to repent. Us older men need to repent for not sowing some things into the next generation and not leading the way. We need to repent for allowing the women to lead everything in the church and we stand by the sidelines. I don't say this in a chauvinist way, but I'm saying this in a way that, believe me, if your lady's standing next to you or sitting next to you right now, she wants you to step up too. She don't care if you're like something powerful on Fortnite or something like that, right? She don't care how cool you are on your video game. She wants to, <laughs> oh Jesus, there's going to be some conversations later after this, right? She don't care about that stuff. She wants you to lead well. She wants to lead you in the family. She wants you to lead in the church. We have a problem, not just Journey Church, but men in general in America. So it was exemplified yesterday, even at the Freedom Conference. There was like 88 ladies and like 22 men in Jesus' name. Like, you think the men need less freedom than the ladies? Come on, Jesus, help us out here, right? Men, we need to be unafraid to lead the way and come up to the front and cry if we need to cry to say, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. Why are we holding on to our pride? We need to lead the way. Amen. Man, can you imagine what would happen at Journey and in our region if men would begin to stand up and be real and godly men? I'm not talking about being macho men in some bad way. I'm talking about leading the way in the love of Christ and the way that he's demonstrating here in scripture. 1 John 2, 13, I write to you children because you know the Father. I write to you fathers because you know who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. You don't need to give in to porn. You don't need to spend all your time on your phone. You don't need to spend all your time with video games. You don't need to spend all your time on football. Man, raise up your children in the way that they shall go and they shall not depart from their ways. Men, we need to lead in life and in the church. I want to preface these next verses by saying that we're all worshipers. We don't have to be taught to do it. We just do it. But God wants to be the number one object of our affection. 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You can never drink enough, you can never own enough, you can never eat enough, you can never vacation enough. All these things ultimately become nothing but joy killers. They steal from us. The place where real joy is found is in the best gift ever that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born in a manger, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death on our behalf that we might have life. He concludes with this, my last verse for today in John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is the love of God that is made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, so that we might live through him and his love, not that we have loved, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, might we also love one another. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Lord, we thank you for your precious spirit that has been here among us today. I know in reading these words, I've been preaching to myself, Lord God, and I can't thank you enough for impacting my own heart and reminding me that yes, Oh, what a sinful man I am, what challenges I have overcome and the challenges that I still have to deal with, that you're there in the midst of it, that you love me, that you care for me, that you'll never leave me or forsake me. You will not abandon me. 
In fact, you love me enough that you would say, hey, I'll take those burdens on me that your burdens might be light, that you would trust in me. Lord, I do take a moment and I pray for the men in this church. Young men, grown men, would we never go back to acting like children? Father, would our hearts be set on serving you and loving you and living and leading and taking authority in a loving and glorious way? And Father, being the men that you've called us to be, men on a forceful advance of the kingdom of God, Father, would we not find joy in the trivial things of this world, Lord, but would we find true joy in you? Would your love and your grace overwhelm us all, man and woman alike, and cause us to desire to please you, to not sin, but to please you in our everyday living? Would you give us the power to overcome those things that so ensnare us? Lord, we love you so dearly, and our heart is to know you, to make you known, and to live well for you. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I spoke when I first started of some of the challenges that we have in our lives, and maybe God's brought some of them to your attention. There's some areas in your life that you know you kind of need to let go of. The beauty is you can come here and leave them at the feet of Jesus. And the key is don't pick them up when you go to walk out of here. That God can forgive you of those deep and abiding things or even the small things that you know just aren't pleasing to him. And if you're struggling in any area of your life, this is your chance to change. Jesus is here in us and amongst us. The Holy Spirit is here. He wants to touch your life. He wants to transform you. He wants to give you joy. He wants to remove that despair from your life and replace it with peace and freedom. So don't miss this moment or this opportunity. I don't want to do anything to embarrass you. I promise you I will not. In fact, everybody's heads bowed. Nobody's looking around right now. If that's you and you know there's some things you need to leave at Jesus' feet, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up really high right where you're at so I can see it. I see yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. Don't be shy. I see a lot of men. Thank you, Lord. Yours and yours and yours. Thank you, God. Keep them up there for one more second. I see yours over there, ma'am. God is moving. God is moving. Man, you could put them down. Thank you so much. There may be some of you that the weight of that stuff is so much that you couldn't even lift up your hand. And pray that God would touch your heart and free you from that right now. There's another group I'd like to speak to for just a moment. Are, are, are you knowing that you need to initiate an area of forgiveness where there's something that either someone did to you or you did to someone and you just know you either need to be forgiven or you need to forgive. Again, I'm not gonna call you up to the front. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody. If that's you, I'll pray for you right where you're at. But if that's you and you need some courage to take the next step, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at as well? I see yours and 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 yours. Thank you, Father, thank you. Father, in the scriptures that we read, we learned of your great love and the ability that only you could give us to overcome sin and be a light unto others. So Lord, I thank you for so moving in this service on the hearts of so many. So many that are carrying weights that seem too hard to bear. Lord, I pray for them right now, this very moment, especially those who raised their hands or maybe didn't and wanted to, that Father, they would truly just confess their sins before you right now and leave them at your feet. In fact, why don't we all do that for just a moment? Just pause and reflect and what's God telling you? He wants to help you to clean up in your life that you could look more like him and image him well. Father, we take these things right now and we just lay them at your feet. We lay them at the foot of the cross and we remember your goodness, your loving kindness. We remember that big theological word, that propitiation, that Father, you died in our place. You took the debt and the burden that we so deserved on your own back. 
Father, may we never forget it. And because of your great love and initiating that with us today, we just dedicate or rededicate our lives to you saying, Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and we believe every word of that. As a result of that, oh God, we will live for you for this moment and ever on. We thank you for the great sacrifice that you made. Lord, we lay these sins at your feet that we might experience all that you have for us, that we might live for you and glorify you and that you would replace the despair of many with great joy. Lord, I pray for those who raise their hand that need to forgive or be forgiven. And Lord, I share that testimony earlier of your goodness and how you made reconciliation for not just one, but two families. I know there's no doubt more stories like that in this very room. People that long to be with another loved one that uh, are praying for a breakthrough in that relationship right now. And uh, Lord, I pray that that would happen, that this Christmas season, a Christmas miracle would happen. And that Father, some would be brave enough if they're the one that needs to initiate it, that they would do so. If someone else needs to, that you would put it on their heart right now, that they would get that phone call that would come and say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't wanna live that way anymore. I want that relationship restored. So Lord, I pray for that right now, that this would be a day of breakthrough in the areas of relationships here at Journey Church, that freedom would come in like a flood. Father, I speak nothing but life and blessing over the people of Journey Church today. Would you guide them? Would you direct them? Would you bless them? Would you give them hope? Would this be one of the best and most joyous Christmas seasons that they've ever experienced? Lord, we give you all the glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you put your hands together for our God?